so far <clears throat> so far I explained to you that logs are friends are your friends because they allow synchronization they allow visibility and uh, you also understood that sometimes logs are your enemies if you are looking on a single object too, too many threads are looking on a single object there will be the what is called log contention just too many waiting threads and uh, it just it's just like a single threaded execution anyway if you have single log and you are just synchronizing on it all your threads then just doesn't make sense all the threads are uh, executed sequentially there is also another danger uh, related to, to logs called dead logs if you have more than one log in your application there might occur a situation that's called dead log uh, 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 you know, th th there is a programming joke, actually. Uh, when uh, somebody is asked on the interview, please explain me what deadlock is and we will hire you. Uh, please hire me and I will explain you what deadlock is. <laughs> so this is the best explanation. So, uh, like, uh, yeah, we have two locks and first, first one is acquired lock A and uh, the second one, the second actor acquired log B, and now the first one needs to acquire log A, uh, uh, log B, but it cannot because it's acquired by by the second actor. But uh, second actor will not release it unless it acquires log A. So the problem is that there are two actors, two logs, and they acquire logs in, uh, um, in different order, like. Uh, uh, like this uh, you have two methods first acquires left then right this acquires right then left it's actually uh, very very easy uh, to, to get deadlock in this situation uh, what's going to happen if you have uh, deadlock just in, in Java virtual machine just two threads will, will stop and wait forever and nothing will happen and uh, like mm, we have uh, mm, we have the same term the same notion in uh, relational databases sometimes two transactions are being made on data and they acquire logs in just a, just different order and dead logs occur uh, relational databases uh, they usually uh, detect these uh, conditions, these situations, and they usually try to solve it, say, by killing one of the threads, just by ro uh, rolling back one. It's called uh, deadlock victim. Some they're choosing just one one of the actors to, to be killed, just one of the transactions to be ro rolled back. Uh, this is because otherwise it would be nearly impossible to effectively use uh, transactional databases. Java Virtual Machine, unlike transactional database, it uh, does nothing about deadlocks. So if you have a deadlock in your in your code, and for example you have hundreds of threads, and two of them are, are in a deadlock, it's even uh, hard to notice that they are in a deadlock. Fortunately, you have uh, special utilities. Uh, the best one, the, the simplest one, is called JSTack. You can just run. Oh, let me. Let me show it to you because uh, it's uh, it's very important, and I just uh, you just have to know. You have uh, JPS utility. It's uh, located in in Java. If you have Java, you all know that you have Java, and uh, you also also have JPS, and JPS shows you uh, the actual Java the IDs of uh, Java processes that Java programs. It's like PS in, in, in Unix, but it's JPS. It shows only Java, Java virtual machines. And now I want to know what this guy is doing at the moment. And I call JSTAG and it, and it shows me the stack traces of all the threads that are running. So you can browse through code, and if uh, there is deadlock situation, it will show you that it's possible that these two threads are possibly in a deadlock. So JSTAG is your is your friend anyway. If your program is stuck, for example, it's stuck in not necessarily in a deadlock, maybe in infinite loop. You have infinite loop, and just problem uh, program hangs. You call JSTAG, and you have all the lines of code that. Uh, uh, the program is currently execute, executing. So it's uh, very powerful, very 
small but powerful tool to, to, to debug things in Java. Okay, so uh, uh, how to fix this code? Apparently, uh, you just uh, you just have to change. If you just change left to right and here left to right two logs you're acquiring in the same order, then nothing wrong will happen. You still have two methods. These methods still have to acquire two logs, but as soon as they acquire them in consistent order, consistent order is uh, is key to avoiding deadlocks. Then nothing wrong will happen. Uh, okay, let's consider this method. It's like uh, the same money transfer, but now we don't we don't deal with uh, uh, with array of accounts. We are dealing with uh, like uh, accounts as objects. So we have account from account, account to account. We have to uh, lock both accounts before before doing some transfer. So we we are doing it like this: synchronized from account, synchronized to account. Uh, how deadlock? might occur. See, we have only one method and this method looks like we're locking, locking them in the same order. But it's not true. Because two threads might, might be executed. One is transferring from account A to account B. Another is transferring from account B to account A. It's like direction of transfer is different. And see, it's not easy uh, to, to uh, see by naked eye, just by watching this code, that uh, this code is prone to deadlocks. Because only one, uh, only one uh, method, you see, only one synchronized pattern, but uh, here can be a number. Uh, in some situation here, we can have deadlock. Uh, your ideas, how can this be fixed? The key is to, to have consider, uh, consistent order of locking, right? So, if we are talking about bank accounts, usually they have numbers. So, before locking, we can order them by their names or their numbers or their ideas, no matter what. So that in any situation, in any situation, either we are transferring from account one to account two or from account two to account one, we will lock them in the same order. First account one, then account two, or vice versa. It doesn't matter, but... Uh, uh, the, the order itself doesn't matter. What's important is that it must be consistent in each and every call. So uh, the usual workaround here is before doing this synchronization, we must uh, just uh, take this to account, compare them by, by, by the ID, and then uh, assign log one and log two so that synchronized log one, synchronized log two will, will occur in the same order. Is it clear? For, for everyone, this example. Okay, I hope it's clear. Uh, so this is just to show you that it's not always easy to to reason about deadlocks. And this is still uh, this is still a trivial code. If you have non-trivial code and you have this synchronization, then you must uh, be aware of possible deadlocks. Always you have to. Uh, to avoid them, and in order to avoid them, you must do what? You must keep the synchronized uh, sections as short as possible. You should never call some long-running methods outside of the synchronized. Because if, uh, if you have, for example, if you are calling some method here, and this method is going to acquire another lock, then it's bad, just bad decision. Because uh, uh, here you just uh, don't control anything. So uh, you might uh, call a method from here, it will acquire another lock and then we'll have a deadlock because some other thread will acquire that lock first and, and so on and so forth. So uh, please keep the synchronized sections as short as possible, as clear as possible and avoid calling uh, another methods that might acquire other locks 
from from uh, from critical sections from a synchronized section so if you have captured the log finish with it as quickly as possible do not call external methods okay this is all it is shortly all about deadlocks but uh, this is a big pain and you you must know about it okay now to good news good news are uh, the, uh, that you don't always need to use low-level algorithms and low-level APIs just like those that I, I, I've shown you so far. Uh, in uh, Java Standard Library we have plenty of uh, helper classes, plenty of uh, helper classes that will allow you to, to write uh, concurrent code easier and uh, uh, make less mistakes make less bugs and uh, we also have a thing uh, under the hood we also have a thing called non-blocking algorithms and non-blocking data structures so far I uh, was talking about situation when we acquire a log then we just release a log and then we see the result of execution it's not the only method of synchronization uh, in modern CPUs, we, call, we have also have so-called compare and swap operations that, lo uh, that work uh, like this. You are setting a value to some remote variable and you are getting the previous value. And, uh, for example, you can call, uh, you have atomic operation, it's supported on a very low CPU level. Like, I expect that this variable uh, has a uh, has value five. Please put number seven to this variable if it has if its previous value is five. And if it's okay, this will succeed. If it's uh, if previous value is not five, it will fail. It will give you oh now the value is six, and you say okay if the value is six then then put uh, number eight not seven but eight because you take into account the previous value. And you are doing this in so-called cast loops, compare and swap loops. So you make, uh, you might make some unsuccessful uh, operations. Like you, you might think that this is a waste of CPU time, and it is a waste of CPU time because you are doing some uh, calculations in vain because somebody already ch changed this variable. But actually, what's good about these cast loops is that you are not blocking anything. So threads are not blocking; they are just flowing, executing in parallel. And uh, this non-blocking non-blocking algorithms uh, uh, turns out to be turn out to be uh, better, more performant than uh, than traditional blocking ones. The bad thing about non-blocking algorithms is that writing the correct non-blocking algorithm is an extremely complex task. Only the best programmers in, wo in the world uh, most of them are scientists, practicing scientists, can invent correct non-blocking algorithms. Uh, it's, I'm not exaggerating. There are just not so many people in the world who, <laughs> who can write uh, correct, new, correct non-blocking algorithms. And these algorithms, uh, okay, fortunately these algorithms are encapsulated in standard Java library. You can rely on them, you can reuse them. But fortunately, you don't have to mess uh, with them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, maybe uh, maybe this lecture uh, you you will be interested uh, in uh, I don't know concurrent and parallel programming starting from this lecture, and <laughs> you will have uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, you, you will want to practice and learn something more about this scientific thing. It's very interesting. It's the whole area of uh, you will have a scientific career in it. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, what do we have for non-blocking in, in Java? First of all, we have a set of very, uh, very convenient, very handy classes called atomic classes. Like uh, we have integer, just simple integer in Java. We have primitive int and we have a proper integer called integer. In Java we also have atomic integer and atomic boolean and atomic reference in general. 
they can be used as uh, enhanced volatiles. Like if we have uh, atomic integer, it's sort of a mutable integer. Simple integer in Java is immutable, as as far as you know. Like uh, right, you you know that the integer in Java is a mutable object, just wrapper around some primitive. But atomic integer is mutable. You can set value and you can get value, and uh, they act like volatile variables. So when you are getting atomic integer, then it's guaranteed for you to see the freshest value. But not only this, we have very handy methods on this, uh, like get and set. It's an atomic. So in one operation, we are getting previous value and set a new value, and we are guaranteed that nobody will ever uh, just insert a value, a new value between this get and this set. So we're just swapping, just like swapping values. So get previous, set my new uh, value, and we are guaranteed that this will be the, uh, the value. Compare and set. This one I already ex uh, uh, explained. Get and increment. This is the, uh, the atomic plus plus operation. So uh, the better way to fix our dump counter example is not by synchronizing. The best way is by using uh, is by using atomic integer and by using this get and increment because this get and increment is not blocking and it will be more performant way. It will also work, but it will be more performant. Uh, and we also have this get and update, and here we can pass a lambda, like uh, get value, calculate a new value based on this old value, and put it and Please make it. Uh, uh, please make it atomically. And here we pass a lambda, and this lambda is, works like isolated one. So it just uh, uh, takes old value, transforms it, and puts new value. Since we have cast loops, uh, sometimes this lambda might be called in vain. Like we we calculated something we are trying to put, but we are late. Somebody. Uh, already have updated this uh, this variable, but it's okay. It will be just called another time. So, uh, see, this is uh, quite complex stuff under the hood, but in terms of API, it's very simple and it's very convenient. So, please use atomic variables uh, when, when you find them appropriate for your task. So, don't don't need to use volatiles uh, with atomics. You can do much better, more, more stuff. But uh, atomics are just uh, primitives, like uh, you are working with single integer or single string. But uh, in most scenarios, you are not working with integers and strings. You are working with uh, data structures like maps and queues and so on and so forth. And of course, Java uh, has full set of uh, concurrent uh, data structures. Uh, in earlier versions, by the way, but Java is quite old one. Uh, it's more than 25 years old, 26 years old. Uh, so it uh, it appeared in 1996, uh, the first version. So it's ancient actually, and uh, yeah, actually it evolved with uh, with the science, with the uh, the way people are just uh, thinking about design of the languages and usages of the API. So uh, in the early versions, um, uh, they have these synchronized droppers. So if you have a collection, for example, map, you can call collections.synchronized map, and uh, your map is, is wrapped into just synchronized droppers. So that uh, all the threads that are going to, to make uh, modifications to your map are doing this sequentially. This works. This is safe. But this is not very performant because uh, usually you, you, you want what? You have map with thousands of values. And if some, uh, if some uh, thread modifying some value, some value 42 in your, in your uh, map, it doesn't interfere with another thread that, modifying, that is modifying another value, say one value 43. So they, they are not interfering. As soon as you are modifying different values in, in your map, they should not block each other. And uh, uh, for this reason now, we have more performant, dedicated, thread-safe collections. Uh, 
but let's start with list. Uh, for in Java, we have the the most commonly used list in Java is of course array list, but it's not a thread safe. If you need a th thread safe uh, list, you have uh, you must use copy on write array list. As its name suggests, each writing to this list implies copying the whole content to into another copy, and uh, just swapping uh, swapping the reference. To, to the freshest version. Uh, so writing to copy on Rai Rai list is not very performant. It's not performant at all. But reading is uh, very performant. So if you have a list and you are writing to it less often than you read, then copy, of write, copy on write Rai list is, uh, is your choice. And it's, it will be thread safe. Uh, you also have uh, concurrent linked queue and deck. In Java, for performant queue and performant deck in, in a single threaded uh, environment, you are using array deck. But in multi-threaded environment, array deck won't work. You have concurrent linked queue and deck, and it works like uh, linked list actually. So it's just a chain of elements, and uh, you can add element uh, for. For Q, you're just adding element uh, from one side and uh, uh, removing element from another side. In deck, deck can work both as, li as, uh, as Q and stack. So you can add and remove elements from head and add and, and remove elements from tail. So it's achieved by uh, utilizing double linked list. But um, the trick here is not because of the structures that it uses, uh, uses uh, linked lists. The trick here because inside they're using uh, non-blocking algorithms with CAS operations. So they're quite tricky. Uh, uh, the implementation is really, uh, uh, really complex here, but you can just use it and you can just have a, a concurrent queue that can be uh, concurrently modified by many, many simultaneous uh, threads and uh, it will uh, work just fine, very performant. We also have blocking queues. Mostly uh, this one uh, does what? If we don't have uh, uh, values, any values in the queue, if queue is empty and we are pulling a value, we'll get null, just no values. So, but this is not what we want in most scenarios. In most scenarios, we want blocking queue, like uh, consumer producer pattern, like somebody or some, it may be one actor or multiple actors, they are pushing values to Q from one side and from another side we are just processing them. And if we don't have any, uh, any objects in the queue, we want to wait until they appear. Like we don't want to terminate operations, we're just going to wait. So for, for this we have a full bunch of, uh, of blocking queues. There are many implementations like uh, array blocking queue, linking blocking queue, it's just uh, you just need to understand the, um, the pattern of usage. How many producers do you have? How many consumers do you have? You have priority blocking queue, like, uh, like it's like priority queue in single threaded execution, but it's also thread safe and can be used in uh, concurrent algorithms. So you, you can utilize this. And, uh, but maybe the most commonly used class in Java for concurrency is this one, concurrent hash map. It's very, uh, also very uh, convenient and uh, uh, very widely used class that, that, is, that works just like a hash map, but it's thread safe. So you can just simultaneously modify many, many values from many different threads in this hash map and will be, it will be thread safe, it will, it will work successfully. And it has useful methods like put a absent, uh, replace, uh, and so on and so forth. Like often you, you need to put a value to some key, but only if it doesn't present in your hash map. You have these useful methods in an in ordinary hash map. Actually, it's, they are default uh, methods in map interface in Java, starting from Java version 8. But for, for simple hash map, they are not thread safe, they are not atomic, so you just cannot rely on them. But if you are using concurrent hash map, you can rely on the fact that this put if absent 
is performed atomically. So it's not like I checked, oh, I don't have a value, let's put a value. But as soon as you put value, somebody already have put it and you're overwriting it. So this might happen in a simple hash map, but it will never happen in uh, concurrent hash map. So you can rely on this as uh, on its atomicity. So uh, also very well thought uh, uh, class and you can utilize it. Uh, by the way, uh, some technical details. Before, in some ancient Java versions, before Java 7, uh, concurrent hash map actually was a map of maps. Like, uh, we had uh, uh, key, you know how hash map works. Yeah, you have key, you calculate hash, you have this uh, array of buckets. So, uh, uh, they had small array of buckets and uh, uh, a number of uh, hash maps, sub subsets of hash maps. So, uh, if you are just... Mm, modifying one key, they f figuring out the sub map and then they lock this map, just synchronize on this map, and then they modify this map. And this was before Java 7. After Java 8, uh, if we look how, how concurrent hash map looks like, like in Java 8 and later versions, it looks like just, a, just like hash map, but the tricky part is here. We are calculating the bucket. We are using cast loop to get the reference to get or to put re reference to, 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 to this uh, list of, uh, of elements that, uh, that are conflicting on, on this bucket. And this list is going to be, uh, to be locked. So if before Java 7 we had limited number of locks, it says uh, by, by default it's 16, if I'm not mistaken. Here, the number of locks, the number of concurrent, uh, uh, concurrent threads that don't interfere with each other uh, is equal to, to the number of elements in this bucket list, and this might be a huge number. So the level of concurrency is uh, uh, just, uh, just very huge. So uh, Java is developing, and the standard library is developing. With each version, we we get more and more performant, uh, performant classes. And we also have a, a thing called concurrent skip list map. I think you know the difference between hash map and tree map in Java. So the main difference is that uh, when you just have a map, single map, it's just like, I have a key, please return me a value associated with this key. If you don't have this value, please return me null. But I know the exact value of key. In uh, navigable map, and tree map is uh, one of its implementations, you can do something like this. I approximately know that the key must be somewhere near to this value. Please find me the closest value to, values to this key. So this is more difficult task, right? And hash map just cannot do this task. It just, uh, it will, with hash map you just have to enumerate all the values in hash map and sequentially search for all the values, which is its closest. But in tree map, uh, you can do this in logarithmic type. So this is why we have tree map in also tree map in Java. But tree map, like hash map, is not thread safe. But what if we want a thread safe navigable map? So we want both navigable maps, so we want to just take advantage from quick searching of the keys, but quick approximate, not exact, but approximate searching of the keys. And we want it uh, concurrent. And we do have such class. And it is, this is, uh, as far as I know, this is the most complex class in Java library. Uh, this is called concurrent skip list map. It's like concurrent skip list. The, the idea is like this. Uh, uh, say you want to, to search for element H and uh, uh, you see it's like layered uh, multi-layered uh, uh, linked list so first you uh, you know that this value H is somewhere in this range and you have this link okay now on the second stage you know that value H is somewhere in this range and you are going here and now you are using just sequential search, but this is going to be fast because it's uh, just a limited number of elements here to, to find this H. 
So uh, this is how skip list works. And you see it's a lot of memory overhead because of all these extra elements and all these extra links. This is why for single threaded execution, Java uses red black tree, not skip list. But for concurrent execution, for concurrent execution, it's just like uh, Java utilizes skip list. And this is how it works when we, we are just adding values. Uh, no, no need to, to, uh, to understand everything here, just uh, the, uh, see the, the whole picture. Like we're adding values, adding values, and some, uh, sometimes we are getting extra level, then we are getting values, and we are getting extra nodes here. At, at, some, at some point, uh, there will be uh, just uh, extra level here. So this is how concurrent skip list map works. Uh, if we look into uh, into its source code, you will find uh, maybe two or three uh, references to th two or three PhD works, some scientific papers, and one uh, one book. <laughs> so actually, this is uh, the most complicated. But the good news is that you need navigable map, you need it uh, uh, thread safe, just new concurrent skip list map and go on put values remove values do whatever you want with it it just will work for you so this is a good uh, uh, library class that you can utilize okay uh, that was all about uh, thread safe data structures in java let's talk about executor framework this is also very very important uh, very important stuff because usually in uh, your real life, you don't create threads as objects in Java, and you don't run them, and you don't join them, just like I sh I've shown you in, in my first example. Usually, you are using executor framework. Uh, why? Why is it so? Because thread in Java is an expensive resource. Each thread uh, has, uh, uh, first of all, each thread has lots of memory allocated to it. Uh, it's 20 megabytes, if I'm not mistaken, by by default. Of course, this can be tweaked, as everything in Java, this can be uh, varied, but uh, each time you create a new thread, it requires not like uh, a couple of bytes or a couple of kilobytes. It requires several megabytes. Why? Because it needs to, uh, to hold its own call stack. Uh, like uh, the stack, you know, the the place in memory where it holds uh, the references of, of all the calls of, of all the methods that it's executing. Uh, so it's uh, really resource consuming stuff. So it's not a good idea to create and uh, remove threads on demand because uh, if before thread is garbage collected, all this memory is on heap. So if you are going to create couple thousands of threads on your Java machine, you will pretty soon run out of memory. So you can try and uh, yeah, it's not a good idea to have many, many threads. So the better idea is to reuse the threads that you already have as much as possible. So that you have to have a so-called thread pool. pool. Uh, you have some list of threads and uh, you just uh, say, okay, uh, this thread is idle. So I'm not, I'm not killing it. It's still waiting. I don't know. This thread is waiting for some work. Then I notify, please wake up and do this work. As soon as you're done, uh, okay, you'll be idle and we'll wait for it. And this, uh, implementing this thread pool is uh, quite, quite a complex task because if uh, uh, some thread, for example, crashed, you have uh, uncaught exception. So you just exited this thread, it's crashed, you need another thread in this. You need to create another thread in your pool. If for some reason you created too many threads uh, at some point, too many tasks, so you created lots of threads, and now you don't need them anymore, but they take up memory. So after some a couple of minutes, you might want to, to just uh, clean up these threads and uh, make them uh, uh, accessible for garbage collector. So, uh, okay, fortunately, again, you don't have to, to write uh, your own connection, uh, your own thread pools, because everything is written for you in Java. 
and uh, now we need to understand another pattern of use of usage this is the the real life pattern how you you are doing uh, concurrent work in Java now uh, first of all uh, we have this fundamental interface called callable in Java and this interface is an abstraction of a computation so it this callable is uh, uh, generic and V is the return value so it can either return a value or throw an exception like just any other method in Java it can either return a value or throw an exception when we have executor service executor service is a uh, is a threads pool so it's just a manager of threads and in this executor service the main method is submit we are submitting a callable of a task and what we are getting immediately so when we're submitting this we immediately getting future and what is future future is like unfinished task unfinished or finished we just don't know you just submitted a task and uh, like I don't know you uh, you brought your laptop to repairs and at repairs you received a ticket instead of your laptop it's a future it's a promise that at some point you will get repaired laptop so it's like a future is like a ticket so uh, it's already it's uh, uh, it's a generic so it has this V parameter and uh, it has uh, this V get method if at some point you understand that you cannot proceed without this value this calculated value you are calling this get on the future and if it's already there then it's okay you're obtaining it if it's not there then you will stop and wait your, your threat will block will be blocked waiting on uh, uh, on the value on the actual value so this is how it uh, usually works you are uh, just uh, spawning many processes in parallel and you are getting a bunch of futures and you are uh, doing as much useful works as you can without these values at some uh, point of time you you need this value so you need to get this or that values then you are calling future dot get and then you are waiting for 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 the process uh, for parallel process to to come uh, to complete it to be finished so uh, this is looks like this so uh, client cl creates a tasks the submit this task to to executor executor creates future this future is returned to client immediately uh, in parallel uh, it runs it, it uh, tasks in a separate thread and as soon as <coughs> as soon as future is completed uh, its value is assigned when you are getting it you might wait for uh, for a little bit for uh, while task is still performed but it, as soon as it performed get will return you the uh, the result uh, so how do you create an executor service because executor service is just an entry point how to create your own callable you understand you just implement this interface with whatever code you want this is the code you want to be executed uh, in parallel how do you create an executor service there are many uh, available variants of uh, connection pools and you can you must choose one depending on uh, your workload uh, so we have for example fixed thread pool uh, if for example you have limited number you always have limited number of CPU cores of course and uh, generally it doesn't make sense to have more threads than there are CPU cores if the task is a uh, uh, heavy computational task so if you have just mm, clearly computational task and you have only eight CPU cores it doesn't make sense to parallelize it more than eight because uh, it's physical the physical core is uh, uh, doing the computation so you might want to use fixed thread pool and uh, fixed it with uh, say eight to, to set it to a number of cores so that when we are submitting a new task it will uh, make it wait you are submitting a new callable and it will make it wait I have only eight workers all of them are busy so yeah please get your future uh, please get your future and go on proceed with what you want but uh, your task will be waiting and will be executed as soon as one of the threads will be idle will, will complete the execution 
So it makes sense for computational tasks, but not all tasks are CPU bound. If task is uh, waiting for network or waiting for, for something, just for some external things to happen, of course it makes sense to create more, way more threads than there are CPUs, just that you don't spend time for waiting. Uh, the, the good default, if you don't know which uh, thread pool to use, the, the good default is uh, cached thread pool. So it's uh, uh, pretty, pretty good default choice because it, uh, it's not limited to, to some number. It uh, uh, grows as needed, but if a thread is inactive for 60 seconds, then it kills it. So it, uh, it will also free up uh, memory if at some point you created too many threads. Uh, okay, so, and there are also, there are also two uh, quite commonly, uh, quite commonly uh, used problems, quite commonly, quite often met problems, like we need to uh, invoke all the methods, all the callables, and wait for all of them to finish. And only after, uh, uh, and only at the point where all of the uh, callables are finished, we can proceed. So we need to wait for all of them. Uh, like uh, in distributed com computations or in parallelized computations, like we split the computation in parts and we want to get all the parts and then combine them in one whole thing. But there is another uh, situation like searching, uh, like we have a full range of possible solutions and we cut it, split it into say four or eight parts and doing search para in parallel. But as soon as we found at least one, so as soon as at least one of them returned, we can cancel all the other jobs. We already got the solution. So there are two, two, two uh, often, I don't know, patterns of usage. And these patterns are supported by methods called invoke all, it's, uh, it's on uh, executor service, it's on a uh, Java thread pool, and uh, invoke any. Uh, for uh, invoke all, you will get the list of future, but it will not get it, uh, you will not get it uh, instantly. Uh, invoke all actually blocks and waits until everything finishes, but uh, you might ask, and why future then? This is because uh, future can encapsulate not only valid result, but also, uh, but also exception. So if you have eight, eight tasks and one of them is with exception, then you will get eight futures, seven will get the results and one will, uh, will just contain exception. So this is why, why you are getting futures here, although all of them will be completed by this time. And with invoke any, it just returns the result, result T. Uh, so it's, it will be the first successful results. If, if all the, uh, if, uh, uh, all the subtasks will end up with exception, then we'll, you will get exception here, of course, but this is, uh, uh, this is a simpler one. So please remember about this invoke all and invoke any, they are very convenient and they will save you a lot of time. So you don't need to invent your own concurrent code just very, very useful and very convenient. Okay, maybe uh, the final topic before we do some interactive writing of concurrent code. And uh, this is about termination. We know how to run tasks in parallel now. We know how, approximately we know how to write good parallel code. But at some point we need to terminate our program. And uh, the problem is how to, to do this correctly. Uh, in first Java versions, they did it this way. We have thread object. On a thread object, we had the stop method and pause method. Like we have a thread and we want to just to finish it, just kill it, like you're killing an application on, uh, on Unix system. So you're just calling stop and thread stops. But pretty soon it turned out to be a very, very bad idea. Why do you think it's a bad idea?
just abruptly abruptly stopping uh, threat execution of the threat at any uh, at just any place No, no, uh, we are not going to reuse. Uh, it's, uh, it's, about, uh, it's really about cancellation and stopping everything. In this thread, it might acquire some locks, right? Uh, well, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, when we're abruptly talking, uh, when we're abruptly uh, stopping the thread, it might just be in the middle of something very important and uh, it just needs some time to finalize. Right, it's, it's, it's a good point, but uh, another bet. What's what's worst is that you might acquire a lock in this thread, and when you kill this thread, this work will never be released. So it just will <laughs> uh, will have you. You will have dreadful deadlocks with this stop method. This is why uh, uh, they they realized it uh, pretty pretty soon, and now you cannot use this stop method on a thread and. Uh, you just never can. Uh, instead of this, we have a mechanism called cooperative termination. And this is, uh, yeah, this is the final theoretical, the last theoretical thing that I would, uh, would like to tell you about, and then we'll have some practical exercise. Okay, uh, this works uh, in this way. Uh, if we have a future, uh, we can call cancel on this future and uh, we can cancel it with false or with true. If we cancel it with false, then we are telling it uh, dear connection pool, if you haven't started my task, please never start it. I don't need it. But it's already being executed, then please finish it. This is uh, when we are calling cancel false. When we are calling cancel true, we are telling executor service the following. Uh, please don't ever start it if you haven't started. But if you are executing it, please try to interrupt. Try to interrupt. Not interrupt, but try to interrupt. Uh, how it's going to happen, I will explain to you later. Uh, uh, also, in executor service, we have this shutdown method, and uh, this just prevents uh, new tasks from being accepted. And also, we have this shutdown now method on... on uh, a connection pool which will try to will try to cancel or will try to shut down all the executed tasks I'm telling this try word because it's really uh, like asking them to shut down and this is why it's called cooperative uh, cooperative termination but uh, how the thread knows that it was asked to be just shut down just to finish it, its work uh, we uh, can, for example, we can see it through via thread dot in is interrupted uh, method call. If we are calling thread dot is interrupted and it returns true at some point, then this means that somebody asked us to finish our work. But if we never call this, we might never just finish. This is why we have to call this method. I will, I will show you how to, to do this correctly. And by the way, we have one final Java memory model for today. This is one final Java memory model rule for today. It's interruption rule. If as soon as we found out that we're interrupted, we can see, we can safely observe all the work of the thread that asked us to interrupt. So it might prepare for us some values and we can safely read these values. Uh, Okay, how, how it's going to work? If, for example, you are doing some long computation in a while loop or in a for loop, it's a good practice to insert into your while loop in your for, for loop checks for a thread dot current thread is interrupted. If you see that it is interrupted, it's a good time for you to exit this loop and finish, uh, finish execution as soon as possible. Uh, but... Uh, in most scenarios, you are not doing just work in some loop. In most scenarios, you have some waiting methods, so blocking methods, like reading values from disk or from network. And these methods, they might cause the so-called interrupted exception. Not only these ones. 
I'm pretty sure you're already familiar with, uh, say, void, if I'm writing, oops, just a moment, if I'm writing it like this, and I'm just uh, doing thread dot sleep, just sleep for one second. See, it's uh, underlined red. I'm pretty sure you, you already came across with this. And this is just, just, what's this? What's this interrupted exception? Should I put it here? Should I make it like uh, this? So this is actually a quite frustrating thing. This, uh, you, you, the only thing that you want here is just to, to sleep for one second, just to wait and then resume. Why do we have interrupted exception here? Now you know why. If for some reason some other thread wants your program to be finished or wants this thread to be th finished, uh, instead of waiting for the whole 10 seconds or minute or hour or whatever, you will prematurely end the sleep with interrupted exception. So it's just they asked you to interrupt at this point. So the problem is what to do this interrupted exception. And uh, by never ever by under no circumstances you, you just uh, you just can silently swallow this interrupted exception please never do this because this is a bad behavior you just uh, you just ruin uh, all uh, the cooperative termination thing in Java if uh, some of your methods in your code throws this interrupted exception the best thing that you can do is just to declare your method as throwing an interrupted exception. This means that you mark it as waiting method. If your method contains just sleep, then it means that actually your method is waiting method, right? So it, it will wait at some point. If your method contains some uh, some reading operations from disk or from uh, from network, it is a waiting uh, it is a waiting method because uh, in some circumstances it, it will stop and wait for something to occur for something external to occur so the the best is when you can just declare interrupted exception in your method sometimes you can sometimes you cannot because uh, you have this uh, signature and you cannot change the signature and you cannot just add interrupted exception it's not that too often uh, because in most in most scenarios you can declare interrupted exception and please do this is the best solution if you cannot then you should use this uh, use scenario uh, you call uh, you you catch interrupted exception then you must uh, I don't know here you can do anything here you can uh, write some logs finish your stuff uh, clean up uh, memories but what you must do here, please don't forget, if you caught this exception, please set current thread interrupted status. Because as soon as you caught this exception, thread is no longer interrupted. So when you exit your method, uh, the, the thread that is using your method will not know that it, it was interrupted. So uh, you should uh, call this current thread interrupt. And then you can return. And uh, the the quicker you return, the better, of course, because you are asked to, to, to interrupt your thread, so you uh, uh, so you must quickly just exit. Uh, so you should never silently swallow an interrupted exception, and it's uh, recommended to lock the fact that interruption occurred. But it, and please never forget this one, because Java compiler will won't tell you anything. It's just something that you should know and you should 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 use. Uh, okay, so this was about uh, uh, interruption, about cooperative term, uh, termination. So, yes, please take this into account also when you write concurrency code. So, as soon as you decided to write some concurrent program, you need to, to remember about proper synchronization, about uh, thread pools, about which data structure to use, and of course you need to remember about cooperative termination and how your program should uh, correctly finish so these are a number of very 
very tricky things and mm, here I can recommend you this code review checklist. This is actually written by Roman Leventov. Roman Leventov is the guy who wrote Apache Druid database. If we are going here, you see there are about 100 points like can use some concurrency utility instead of a log, can avoid nested critical sections, so on and so forth. Uh, so it's about 100 questions that you might ask about your code to make it correct concurrent code. So uh, this is a very, uh, very useful uh, resource. Uh, all right, actually uh, uh, in this, uh, in these slides, we also have a section on completable future, but uh, unlike any other things, I think about completable future, you can read pretty much everywhere. So you can just find any tutorial. It's a thing like, it's a, uh, like future on steroids. It's be a better future. Like uh, in, in a simple future, all that you can do is just get and wait for, for it. In completable future, you can combine your futures. Like uh, uh, if you have an API that returns completable future, some in the future I will return you uh, an object A. Okay, and you know the method that can convert object A to object B. Then you can combine this uh, mapping to completable future and get completable future of B. Because if ultimately you want B out of completable future of A and some lambda, you can get completable future of B and just forget about it. Uh, so it will fully asynchronously, uh, uh, fully asynchronously calculate B for you and at some point in your code you will just get B dot get and you will get this B. Uh, so uh, it's a very nice, very nice feature, but uh, we have only 20 minutes left and I don't want to, to lose it. I don't, I, I want you to do some quiz quick quiz and let's try to write a small bit of concurrent code and we will make some experiments on JC stress also what we see here is a so-called single tone pattern actually it's not a good it's not considered a good practice anymore uh, this uh, code pattern was considered a good practice maybe 90s but not now when we have dependency injection, but that's another story. That's a whole another, another story. We're talking about just about concurrency today. And uh, uh, from this point of view, what uh, singleton class is? It's just, uh, you see, static final instance that's created only once. And it's uh, private, so it's encapsulated. And uh, we have this public static get instance method. So from many, many places of code, we can refer to this and only this one single instance of single tone. And since its constructor is also private, uh, nobody can ever create a second instance of single tone. Why do this? we need this, uh, for example, uh, connection pool of the database? Usually we need only one connection pool. We need the, uh, the pool of connections to be one and only one for the whole huge program. So this is why things like connection pools are singleton. So some resources that are on must be created only once. Okay. Uh, let's say for some reason we decided to make it lazy. What does this mean? It means that uh, this might be a huge object. This might be an object that's difficult to create or it takes some time or resources to be created. So let's write it this way, in such a way that if we never call this get instance, then we never create this single tone, right? So we can create it like this. Like we create this instance and this get instance con uh, contains this if. If instance is not created, then we're creating a new one. But we're doing it only once anyway uh, and we return this instance and uh, okay this singleton is only once or not because this code is not going to work well in concurrent uh, environment right because if it's single threaded it will work perfectly 
because uh, the second call uh, on the second call we see that this instance is not null so we're using it and we're creating uh, we're not creating another single tone right but uh, if we are going to to use this concurrently then at some point multiple instances can be created because we are not guaranteed to see the freshest value of this instance right and i can tell you before just before our classes i ran just to uh, see observed forbidden state singleton created twice it works like uh, let me uh, let me show it's just a just a code on slide Oh, it's even not synchronized, sorry, this one. So, uh, 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 this one, if we run this one uh, in GC stress, it will observe a situation where uh, uh, this arbiter method just checks that uh, two results are the same of uh, that, uh, that return these instances. So, uh, it will observe the fact that uh, uh, there exists actually two singletons, and this is not what we want. So we want it to create it only once. So how can we fix this code? Now you, you know everything about synchronizations, volatiles, and so on. So I'm waiting for your ideas. No ideas. Synchronize. Okay, we might think about volatile, but volatile won't do because, uh, uh, again, uh, we are uh, just getting the freshest ones, but we are not guaranteed from uh, creating it twice, right? So volatile will, won't help us. So we want to use synchronized, right? So that's what we uh, usually. Well, uh, okay, yeah, volatile. Uh, yeah. Uh, there will be no no guarantees that it will create only once so it's the freshest but here we'll get it twice uh, like uh, two uh, it was now uh, two threads came here instant uh, simultaneously and they read null value and they simultaneously created uh, the single tone then of course all the other threads will get uh, not null value but sometimes we will get uh, two single tones Okay, synchronized. Uh, as soon as we made this uh, this method synchronized, by the way, which uh, which object is used as uh, intrinsic lock here, as an intrinsic monitor here? It's static method. So, in, if it wasn't static, then this is used as uh, intrinsic lock. If it's static, then class itself is used as uh, intrinsic lock. By the way, I just uh, had to, to, to say this. But anyways, uh, it's class. Class, of course, there is only one class in, <laughs> in the class instance in the whole program. So it's good. Uh, we are synchronizing static methods. So only one, uh, uh, only one thread at a time can enter it. And inside it, it will check for null and uh, if it's not null, it will return an instance. If it's null, it will create a new single tone. What's the problem with this code? How, how do you think? It works. If I run it on uh, JC stress, it will uh, work just fine. By the way, let me run it on JC stress. And meanwhile, please think what's, uh, what's the problem if it's not about functionality? Uh, is it single tone factory four? Uh, see, it's synchronized. Uh, two actors, so let's run singleton factory four. And while it's running, and it uh, it must be okay. So no no errors. This is a correct concurrent code. But what's the problem with this code? Artur, if many threads are just asking for this value <coughs> simultaneously. How it's going to work? They will all queue up here, right? It's like, I don't know, it's like uh, 
uh, like a shop with only one cashier. <laughs> so there will be a long queue. And why, why the, it should not be any queue here? Because uh, we're creating this uh, we're creating this singleton only once. But uh, uh, so we need this synchronization on writing only once. But we are synchronizing the whole method, so all the threads have to queue up to get the same instance. It's not going to work uh, well performance-wise. So we need better performance here. Did it finish? Error tests, no matches. So you see, this is valid code. This is this code is valid, but not good performance-wise. So okay. Uh, your ideas how how can we check per how how can we fix performance here maybe extra ifs some maybe move some synchronization inside what do you think No, no, it, ac it uh, occurs when two threads occurs, uh, locks t uh, acquires two locks. For deadlock to occur, you need two threads, at least two threads, and then two uh, locks. Here, in my example, uh, no thread lock will ever occur because we are locking on, on only one resource. We have only one synchronized here. We have only one lock. So uh, if you are having only one lock, then you can forget about deadlocks. They won't happen. What, what might happen is long queue. It's like mm, uh, deadlock if, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 the, same, uh, the same example with the shop and cashiers. If the same, you, you are going to, to, the first, uh, to the first cashier and, then, and it says, oh, please go to the second cashier, but uh, it cannot be freed and, and just serve another, another customer. Uh, only, only after you get something from the second cashier, and then uh, uh, some someone else goes to second cashier, and uh, uh, the second says, "Oh, please go to the first, and then just everything blocks, because you cannot proceed because uh, the the second cashier waits for for the first customer for the first cashier, and the first cashier waits for you. So it's only when we have two cashiers, two two points of synchronization." Here, in my example, uh, 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 till the end of this example, you can forget about dead loss because we have only one cashier, only one uh, place of synchronization. But it's, it's bad that we have only one, right? Because uh, uh, if it's synchronized, then everybody will have to queue up to get the value. But we don't want them to queue up to get the value so if it's already there, right? So what might be the solution? How about, uh, how about this one? So we have a uh, private lock. Oh, it's a, better, it's a better code anyway. So uh, we are doing it this way. Instance, we're checking for instance. If it's null, we are doing uh, uh, synchronized. So we're entering it. But we want... Uh, uh, but we want what? We want uh, it to uh, to create only once. So we entered synchronized, and we must check that no one else managed to get here and create a new instance. So we're double checking it, and if it's still null, then we're creating an instance, right? And if it's not null, if it's not null then we're returning an instance. Uh, what's the problem here? This is the crucial <laughs> uh, stage. So if you understand this one, I believe you, you will understand much about writing correct concurrent code in Java. So this code contains concurrency bug. And you even don't need to to reason deep about what's going to happen and how it's going to work. You must just, looking at this code, you must see, oh, it's a concurrency bug. So I, I'm not going to commit this code. I'm not going, if I'm doing code review, I'm do, not going to accept this code. 
even without understanding what this code is doing. It's quite easy. But I want you now to, to, to see this. You have this C instance. You are checking this instance outside of synchronized block. You are doing the synchronized creation of the instance so that you will create it only once, right? And you return this instance if it's not null. What's the problem? I want you to, to answer me. You know what Java memory model is, right? You know Java memory model rules. Let's try to, to remember them. First one is about single-threaded execution. Okay, it's not a single-threaded execution. Second one guarantees us to see the freshest value of a volatile variable. We don't have any volatile variables. Third one guarantees us if we acquire a log and we release the log and then we acquire the same log again in the second thread, then we are guaranteed to see the values, uh, uh, the work of the previous thread. So it works in this section. Then we have thread termination rules, then we have something else, something about finals, but we don't have finals. So how about this one, about reading this one? What Java memory model rule guarantee us to read this value. No Java memory model rule. Because we synchronized on writing, we acquire this log, we release this log, but when another thread comes here, it doesn't acquire any log. Not this log, so it doesn't acquire it. So it doesn't guarantee to see its value. So when you are writing concurrency code and you want a variable to be visible, you must either make it volatile or you should uh, access it through logs, through the same logs. If you are synchronizing only writing and not synchronizing reading, then some, some strange things might occur. You might ask how, let me show you. Let me show you, it's attempt number five. It's uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's like this. See, we are checking instance for null. We are having this uh, synchronized and double check. And we are returning instance. And uh, uh, what we are going to uh, to check is that uh, first of all we are returning the same instance, and second is that. Uh, the um, the internals of this instance is like this. It's like uh, you see this singleton uh, contains only one byte. This byte contains 42, and uh, uh, the only accepted outcome is like uh, we have uh, 42 inside our singleton, and uh, both singletons are the same. So uh, let me run this and see: is it is it true or not? A singleton factory five. Uh, by the way, can you guess uh, what's going to happen here? See, we are, we are checking this instance for now, by the way. You might see, okay, okay, we are checking it for now. You, you see, you, you told us that we are not guaranteed to see the freshest value. So if it's not freshest, if, if it's stale, if it's stale value, it's null value, right? If it's stale, it's null, so we are going to come here and synchronize via this log. And inside this log, we will see that it's not null and we will exit and everything will be okay. Right? But still, the problem exists. And the problem is that in some circumstances, we will see... Not 42, 42 true, as we think, but some 1, 42, 42, 1. What's this 1? Where it came from? I just, uh, uh, just look at this code. Uh, it's uh, singleton. It looks like this. Uh, oh, it, it looks like if, 
this byte is null, it's not initialized, then we are returning one. Uh, if, uh, if singleton is null, then we are returning zero, but uh, in this scenario, singleton is never null because we are checking for null. Uh, if uh, byte is not null, then we are returning this 42. So, in some circumstances, we are reading not fully initialized singleton. And <coughs> uh, looking again at this picture, you might notice that uh, in some scenarios, it's like we entered this synchronized block. We, uh, we started to create a new one, so we created a new singleton, and we assigned the value to this instance. But uh, for performance, so for some performance, for the sake of performance, Java first assigned non-null reference to this instance, but it just uh, haven't completed initialization of the singleton. So here we see that instance is not null, but it's not initialized, it's empty inside. But, uh, yeah, 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 we will use volatile uh, 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 at the next step, but at this step, yeah, you, you have to realize, here we synchronized writing, but we failed to synchronize, read, uh, synchronize reading, and without, without just understanding what this code does, it's just an incorrect code. So this is how you, should do your, the code review of uh, any concurrent code. All readings and writings must be synchronized. Okay, volatile. Volatile. What if we add volatile here? How do you think? Is it going to work or not? Uh, it's actually singleton factory six. It's 42, 42, true. And let me run it. Yeah, volatile guarantees us uh, that everything is correct. Because when we read this uh, instance here, memory fence is going to be executed and Java is going to guarantee that all the initialization is finished. So yeah, there's uh, lots of guarantees. So let us, You have, see, there are, it's still executing, but we have zero failed, zero failed, no, uh, failed test, no matches, error test, no matches. The only outcome uh, that there was is this one, 42, 42 true. So fully initialized singletons and singleton is a real singleton never created twice. But this code has problem. What's the problem here? Well, now you can easily guess if something uh, works correctly and this code works correctly and I say there's a problem in this code, then the problem actually is not in bugs but in performance, right? <laughs> so it's, uh, this code is not, uh, is not that performant as it should be. And what's the problem with performance? How do you think? We have this volatile instance. And you understand that reading volatile variable is an uh, expensive operation because it flushes caches and so on and so forth. And we have, uh, we read it once and read it twice. So per, per each uh, execution of get instance, we have two volatile reads, two expensive operations. So we might fix it if we just uh, read this value, cache it somewhere, and reuse it as a local variable so that we avoid um, reading volatile field twice. The next is going to, to be an example from real life that show, that's going to show you how difficult, in fact, is to, to write correct concurrent code. Although I, I, I think I already convinced you that it's... <laughs> Uh, hell of a difficult, it's just... <laughs> uh, but anyways, we have this uh, Josh Bloch's book on effective Java, and uh, this book is a must read for, for everyone who is going to be professional Java developers. And we, uh, in the, the most recent edition, in third edition, uh, we have this example of a lazy singleton. 
So uh, uh, he also discusses the way to create a effective uh, lazy singleton thread safe. Uh, so George um, Bloch proposes this example as a solution. So see, we have this instance, volatile instance. We're having this volatile read here. And then we are using it. If it's not null, then we return and it's a happy path. It's uh, uh, what should should occur in most of the cases, right? So we are reading volatile instance. It's not null. Great. We're returning it. If it's null, then we are going to this synchronized lock and do double check. While you are looking for a bug in this code, I will run GC stress test but wait this is an example from the bible of java developers it's effective java third edition josh bloch josh bloch is the author of java uh, library itself himself so <laughs> but this code contains bug let me run gc uh, stress and meanwhile please try to figure out what the bug is uh, it's uh, singleton factory 7 so it's Joshua Bloch's code, as you can see. Uh, it's this one, and let it let us run. So what's going to to fail? Oh, come on! It's easy. Let's let's just reason about what's what's going to happen. Uh, happy path. Happy path is okay, right? So uh, we read this result. If it's not null, we return it. So it's it's great. And we're reading uh, we're reading volatile only once. And George Bloch says on my machine it's about 1.4 times as fast. And uh, it's true because volatile reading is expensive. Uh, now on happy path, we read this value. It's null. It's null. Now we're entering this uh, log section. If it's still null, then we're assigning instance and result to a new singleton, right? And return the result. But if it's not null, here, if somebody managed to just uh, get to the synchronized uh, block just after, after the first one, then what we are going to return? Now, right? Let's see what uh, let's see what JC stress code for us. Uh, forbidden, forbidden. Which is forbidden? Uh, zero forty two and forty two zero. Zero means uh, that it it is now, actually. Because let me show you again. We have this uh, uh, because uh, uh, GC stress is actually quite a quite a trivial thing. It just can uh, work with results with simple results with uh, uh, primitive result value. So we need to convert uh, non-primitive results to primitive. So uh, here I have this math ma map method. If singleton is null, I return one. If singleton is not initialized internally, I return uh, I return zero. I return one, and then I return this 42 because it's uh, so. We have 0, 42, the, which means that under some circumstances, we get, get empty singleton, not null value. So this is obviously a bug, and this bug contains in, in the Bible of Java developers. Well, actually, uh, when I first realized this, I, uh, I thought that, uh, oh, it uh, cannot be that somebody uh, didn't notice this and uh, I searched on the internet and I found this discussion on Twitter and uh, yes, somebody just pointed out exactly this bug and <laughs> uh, Josh Bloch says that someone who shall go nameless but whose ideas Shepelov suggested this improvement and I didn't think hard enough. Uh, well, Shepelov is another very important folk in Java community and uh, he's also author, he's author of, he's writing garbage collectors, for example, and lots of uh, Java performance stuff. So uh, these are smart folks. 
very smart folks. <laughs> These are folks who know how to write Java concurrency. <laughs> and still they are prone to mistakes in Java concurrency, of course, because as now you, you can plainly see that it's, uh, you have to be extremely cautious with this stuff. You should be very, uh, very, very cautious and uh, understand what you are doing. Fully understand what you are doing. So yeah, this was my reaction, and actually, this is the only correct uh, lazy thread safe singleton implementation. Let me let me run JC stress for singleton factory eight. This is the see, it's just the eight try. So we we did eight iterations before we get here. Eight. Uh, let me just. Oops, it's it's six. I need eight. Uh, uh, so, yeah, this is this is extremely difficult, and we only we we, we were trying we were trying to solve uh, quite a trivial quite a trivial task. Just like uh, give me a singleton that's create uh, an instance only once, create it on demand, and make it a thread safe. And as you can see, this is uh, not an obvious code. And uh, thanks God, JC stress helps us. To just to be sure that uh, we make everything correctly. So uh, now it's time for me to wind up, and some uh, some suggestions for you. Uh, we have this this book, uh, uh, Java Concurrency in Practice, and it's very ancient one. It's released in 2006, and no new editions were published since then. Uh, but usually, if we have uh, if we have technical books uh, released in English, uh, usually uh, they they either they got translated pretty quickly or they are not published in other languages at all. Uh, for example, in Russian language, this book uh, was released how many 14 years ago. So this is quite unusual uh, situation for a technical book because technical books got outdated <laughs> very soon. This one. Uh, uh, well, it is outdated because it's, uh, it was released in uh, era of Java 5.0. So many, many things that I told you about uh, concurrent uh, data structures are outdated, about uh, executor frameworks, they are outdated. But still, Java memory model is the same. Java memory model rules are the same. All this low level stuff like wait notify works the same. And it's explained in this book pretty thoroughly. So. Uh, I can recommend you this one if you are going to uh, to write some concurrent code or if you are going to uh, uh, just go to job interview and uh, you, 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 you've been warned that they will ask you something about concurrency. They love to ask about concurrency, but uh, pretty rarely, con con concurrent code uh, is uh, written pretty rarely in Java, actually. Uh, code review checklist already... Uh, uh, yes, I already shown it to you. So, yeah, this is it. Yeah. And by the way, uh, by the way, couple of years ago, I uh, when I prepared this lecture for the first time, uh, I just wrote on Twitter that, uh, hey, folks, Java community out there, I'm going to prepare a couple of lectures on Java concurrency, but this is an extremely uh, complex stuff and it's very easy to make a mistake. So could you please review the slides? And see, this many people, this many smart folks reviewed my slides, and they found maybe 20 or so suggestions and corrections for these slides. Actually, so yeah, I'm thankful to all of them, and still all the errors and inaccuracies are mine. There are inaccuracies in concurrency stuff, <laughs> uh, but yeah, still it's uh, it's a great feature of Java language. So yeah, this is all. Thank you for listening.